This is the Christmas miracle of Jonathan Toomey. The village children called him Mr. Gloomy, but in fact, his name was Toomey, Mr. Jonathan Toomey. And though it's not kind to call people names, this one fit quite well, for Jonathan Toomey seldom smiled and never laughed. He went about mumbling and grumbling, muttering and sputtering, grumping and griping. He complained that the church bells rang too loud or too often, that the birds sang too shrilly, that the children played too loudly. Mr. Toomey was a wood carver. Some said he was the best wood carver in the whole valley. He spent his days sitting at a workbench carving beautiful shapes from blocks of pine and hickory and chestnut wood. After supper, he sat in the straight back chair near the fireplace, smoking his pipe and staring into the flames. Jonathan Toomey wasn't an old man, but if you saw him, you might think he was, the way he walked bent forward with his head down. You wouldn't notice his eyes, the clear blue of an August sky, and you wouldn't see the dimple in his chin since his face was mostly hidden under a shaggy, unrimmed, untrimmed beard specked with sawdust and wood shavings. And depending what he'd ate that day with crumbs of bread or a bit of potato or dry gravy. He doesn't sound very happy. One day in early December, there was a knock at Jonathan's door. Mumbling and grumbling, he went to answer it. There stood a woman and a young boy. I'm the widow McDowell. I'm new in your village. This is my son, Thomas, the woman said. I'm seven and I know how to whistle, said Thomas. Whistling is a pish posh, said the woodcarver gruffly. I need something carved, said the woman. And she told Jonathan about a very special set of Christmas figures. Her grandfather had carved for her when she was a girl. After I moved here, I discovered that they were lost, she explained. I'd hoped that by some miracle, I would find them again, but it hasn't happened. There are no such things as a miracle, the woodcarver told her. Now, could you describe the figures for me? There were sheep, she told him. Two of them with curly wool, added Thomas. Yes, two, said the widow, and a cow, an angel, Mary, Joseph, the baby, Jesus, and the wise men. Three of them, added Thomas. Will you take the job, asked the widow McDowell. I will. I'm grateful. How soon can he have them ready? They will be ready when they are ready, he said. But I must have them by Christmas. They mean very much to me. I can't remember a Christmas without them. Christmas is pish posh, said Jonathan gruffly, and he shut the door. My, he's friendly. The following week, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door. Muttering and sputtering, he went to answer it. There stood the widow McDowell and Thomas. Excuse me, said the widow, but Thomas has been begging to come and watch you work. He says he wants to be a woodcarver when he grows up and would like to watch you since you are the best in the valley. I'll be quiet. You won't even know I'm here. Please, please, piped in Thomas. With a grumble, the woodcarver stepped aside to let them in. He pointed to a stool near his workbench. No talking, no jiggling, no noise, he ordered Thomas. The widow McDowell handed Mr. Toomey a warm loaf of cornbread as a token of thanks. Then she took out her knitting and sat down in a rocking chair in a far corner of the cottage. Not there, bellowed the car woodcarver. No one sits in that chair. So she moved to the straight back chair by the fire. Thomas sat very still. Once, he, when he needed to sneeze, he pressed his finger under his nose to hold it back. Once, when he wanted desperately to scratch his leg, he counted to 20 to keep his mind off the itch. After a long time, Thomas cleared his throat and whispered, Mr. Toomey, may I ask a question? The woodcarver glared at Thomas, then shrugged his shoulders and grunted. Is that my sheep you're carving? The woodcutter nodded and grunted again. Then it, Another very long time, Thomas whispered, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, but you're carving my sheep wrong. The widow McDowell's knitting needle stopped clicking. Jonathan Toomey's knife stopped carving. Thomas went on, 
It's a beautiful sheep, nice and curly, but my sheep looked happy. That's pish posh, said Mr. Toomey. Sheep are sheep. They can't look happy. Mine did, answered Thomas. They knew they were where they were with the baby Jesus, so they were happy. After that, Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. When the church bells chimed six o'clock, Mr. Toomey grumbled under his breath about the awful noise. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas sneezed three times, then thanked the woodcarver for letting him watch. That evening, that was after a supper of cornbread and boiled potatoes, the woodcarver sat down at his bench. He picked up his knife and picked up the sheep. He worked until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door. Griping and grumbling, he went to answer it. There was the widow with her son. May I watch again? I'll be quiet, said Thomas. The teapot is warm, Mr. Toomey said gruffly. While Mr. Toomey carved, the widow McDowell poured tea. She touched the woodcarver gently on the shoulder and placed a cup of tea and a bun next to him. He pretended not to notice, but soon both the plate and the cup were empty. Thomas tried to eat his bun as quietly as he could, but almost impossibly quiet when you're seven and you're eating a warm, sticky raisin bun without making some smacking and licking and satisfied noises. When Thomas had finished, he tried to sit quietly. But his legs fell asleep. A few days later, there was a knock at the woodcover's door. He smoothed it down his hair as he went to answer it. May I watch again, asked Thomas. As Mrs. McDowell warmed the tea and put a plate of fresh molasses cookies on the workbench, Thomas watched the woodcarver on the figure of an angel. After a very long time, Thomas spoke. Mr. Toomey, is that my angel you're carving? Yes. And would you do me the favor of telling me exactly what I'm doing wrong? Well, my angel looked like one of God's most important angels because he was sent to baby Jesus. And just how does one make an angel look important, asked the woodcarver. You'll be able to do that, said Thomas. You're the best woodcarver in the valley. After another very long time, Thomas spoke. Mr. Toomey, excuse me. May I ask a question? Do you ever stop talking? Asked the woodcarver. My mother says I don't. She says I could learn about the virtue of silence from you. Under his beard, the woodcarver's face turned pink. The Mac widow McDowell's eyes turned red as she, the scarf she was knitting. Well, speak up. What's your question? Will you please teach me to carve? I'm a very busy man, grumbled the woodcarver. But he put down his important angel. You'll carve a bird. A robin, I hope, said Thomas. I like robins. With a piece of charcoal, the woodcarver sketched a robin on a piece of brown paper. He handed Thomas a small block of pine and a knife and showed him how to lop the corners from the block and slowly smooth the edges of the wood into curves. Thomas copied the woodcarver's strokes, head bent, tongue working from side to side as he concentrated. When the church bells chimed six o'clock, Jonathan Toomey was holding Thomas's hand in his, guiding the knife along the edge of a wing. He didn't hear them ringing. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. She reached out and brought two especially large pieces of wood shaving from Jonathan Toomey's beard. He thanked the wood carver for teaching him how to carve. Later, after supper of boiled eggs with molasses cookies, Jonathan Toomey went to his workbench. He thought for a long time. He sketched drawing after drawing. Finally, he picked up his carving knife and worked on the angel until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there's that knock on the door. This time she had a bouquet of pine dough, boughs and holly sprigs dotted with berries. And there stood Rob Thomas clutching his partly carved robin. While Thomas and Mr. Toomey carved, Mrs. McDowell put a bouquet in a jar of water. She scrubbed Mr. Toomey's kitchen table and set the jar in the center on a pretty cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies, which she found in a drawer below the cupboard. Next, I will carve the wise men and Joseph, the woodcarver said to Thomas. Perhaps before I begin, you will tell me all about the mistakes I'm going to make. 
Well, said Thomas, my wise men were wearing their most wonderful robes because they were going to visit Jesus. And my Joseph was leaning over baby Jesus like he was protecting him. He looked very serious. And they carved some more. I found the cloth, and he saw the, afterward he saw the cloth on the table. I found the cloth in a drawer. I thought it would look pretty on the table. Never open that drawer, the woodcarver said harshly. When the two had left, Jonathan put the cloth away. That evening, after supper of boiled potatoes, the woodcarver worked on Joseph and the wise men until his eyelids dropped shut. There they are down there. A few days later, there was another knock. Thomas watched the woodcarver. When it was time to leave, Jonathan said to Thomas, I'm about to begin the last two figures, Mary and the baby. Can you tell me how they looked? They were the most special of all, said Thomas. Jesus was smiling and reaching up to his mother, and Mary looked like she loved him very much. Thank you, Thomas, said the woodcarver. Tomorrow is Christmas. Is there a chance the figures will be ready? The widow McDowell asked. They'll be ready when they're ready. I understand, said the widow, and she handed Jonathan two packages. Merry Christmas, she said. Jonathan folded his arms across his chest. I want no presents, he said harshly. That's exactly why we're giving them, answered the widow. She put them down on the table and left. Jonathan sat down at the table. Slowly, he opened the first package. Inside was a red scarf, hand-knit, warm and bright. He tied the scarf around his neck. The other package held a robin, crudely carved a pine. A smile twitched at the corners of Jonathan's mouth as he ran his fingers over the lopsided wings. He dusted off the fireplace mantle with his sleeve and placed the robin exactly in the center so he could look at it from his chair. The woodcarver did not eat supper that day. Instead, he began to sketch the final figures, Mary and Jesus. He drew Mary, then watered the sketch into a ball and tossed it on the floor. He drew the baby, watered the sketch into a ball and tossed it in the fire. He sketched again, and he crumpled it up again. Soon there was a mountain of crumpled papers at his feet. He picked up a block of wood and tried to carve, but his knife would not do what he wanted it to do. He hurled the chunk of wood into the fireplace and sat staring at the flames. When he heard the church bells ring, announcing the midnight Christmas service, he got up. Slowly, he opened the drawer beneath the cupboard, and he told the widow to never open it. From it, he took the cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies. He took out a rough wooden shawl and a lace handkerchief. He took out a tiny white baby blanket and a, a little pair of blue socks. He placed each piece gently on the floor from the bottom of the drawer. He lifted out a picture frame, beautifully carved of deep brown chestnut wood. In the frame was a charcoal sketch of a woman sitting in a chair, reaching up. No, the baby's arms were reaching up, touching the woman's face. The woman was looking down at the baby, smiling. Jonathan sat down in his rocking chair and held the picture against his chest. He rocked slowly, his eyes closed. Two tears trailed down into his beard. When he finally took the picture to his workbench and began to carve, his fingers worked quickly and surely. He carved all through the night. The next day, there was a knock on the widow McDowell's door. When she opened it, there stood the woodcarver, his neck wrapped in a red scarf, holding a wooden box, stuffed with straw. Mr. Toomey, said the widow, what a surprise. Merry Christmas. The figures are ready, he said as he stepped inside. From the box, Jonathan unpacked two curly sheep, happy sheep, because they were with Jesus. He unpacked a proud cow and an angel, a very important angel with a mighty wings stretching from its shoulders right down to the hem of its gown. He unpacked three wise men, wearing the most wonderful robes, edged with fur and frolic in rich folds. He unpacked a serious and caring Joseph. He unpacked Mary, wearing a rough woolen shawl, looking down, loving at her precious baby son. Jesus was smiling and reaching up to touch his mother's face. 
That day, Jonathan went to Christmas service with the widow McDowell and Thomas. And that day, in the churchyard and village, children saw Jonathan throw back his head, showing his eyes as clear as an August sky, and laugh. No one ever called him Mr. Gloomy again.